Did we get some? Okay. Um, so hello everyone. So it's my pleasure to have the first presentation of the lunch. So if you fell asleep, be quiet please. Um, if it's too boring, please let me know. Um, so I'm gonna speak about the uh, supernova phase two system today, which is uh, uh, the second system in a row at LRZ, LRZ is the Latinx Supercomputing Center in Garty, which is uh, in a minute. Um, so my name is Thurston Roth. I'm working for the NOVO as an HPC systems architect. Um, I, I started with IBM, so, so if you allow me to tell you a bit about uh, how I started. I started in, uh, was in 2005 with IBM. Uh, I mainly was working in the x86 group, and as if you're uh, as you have heard, that uh, IBM sold this technically six business to Lenovo, and I was part of it. So I'm now working since the beginning of this year for Lenovo. I have exactly the same situation, well, exactly the same position. So being one of the HPC system architects in Germany, uh, working for the uh, RCR and the uh, German clients. So uh, furthermore, I'm the lead architect for the system. Uh, that's currently being installed. I was heavily involved in the, in the first system that has been installed in 2012. So I'm now I'm leading so, so the proposal phase. I led the proposal phase. I led the, uh, the design phase and now the installation of the system. Um, I trade that was your request to spend just half an hour. I have uh, 30, uh, 45 minutes, so I, I will be quick. I'll set this in your interest. Okay, so let me speak a little about the Lenovo itself, if you know. So Lenovo, um, Lenovo is a, um, it's a, a Fortune 500 technology company and roughly 60,000 uh, employees worldwide. Um, it's roughly 40, million, 40 billion US dollar company. It's listed in uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange and it has two headquarters, one is in Raleigh. It's in fact it's in Marshville, which is very close to Raleigh. And the other one is in Hong Kong. And it has uh, research sites across the planet, so it's uh, in the US, and Japan, and China. And there's also one coming up very soon in Stuttgart area, so we are starting to open a UPC research center in the Stuttgart area. <coughs> and we have our manufacturing in the US, India, Brazil, Mexico. Um, that has been taken over from IBM, of course. Um, and yeah, so we're listed at, you, you probably know the, uh, the, the history of, uh, of the Nova, what has happened. They bought IBM's PC division a couple of years ago, and they made it into the number one worldwide PC market. So they, they have the goal to do the same for the x86 business. They said, they, we have the goal. Why are you working on so, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, that's what I mentioned in the beginning that uh, we're opening an HTC center in Germany, in Stuttgart. So that is uh, not only German based, it's European based, that, um, that uh, has some implications to running our fees so that you have a dedicated resource in the country or at least in the European countries. It will be a permanent HTC benchmarking and research and development center. There are a couple of uh, industry partners and clients listed below. This is pretty open. So if one of you is interested in being a partner or, uh, or, or a client, so you're absolutely welcome. We can establish that. There is, a, I think, the official opening is in May. There is one either today or tomorrow for the VPs. It's today. You know that. That's good. Yeah, so um, you see the uh, major uh, supercomputing centers that are, for the moment, the partners, uh, such as uh, LRZ, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, RZD, um, and some others, and more will come. So this is a sort of collaboration. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of uh, activities with the clients, uh, with our partners, uh, be it from uh, industry or from IRZ. So that's something that we established So what's what's the agenda for today? The agenda is, of course, I'm talking about the I will give you an update on what's happening at 
that was a little confusing tonight. First of all, I will give you a rough uh, red view of what happened in the phase one system. And if you were here in 2011 and 2013, Klaus Sattler, this is a lead of mine, he had two presentations. So the first one works about the superwork system itself. In 2011, it works with one, but it hasn't been uh, installed at this point in time. Uh, so he was roughly uh, speaking about the goal of LRV, which is energy efficient uh, supercomputing center, energy efficient uh, software stack, and um, uh, heat recovery, and things like that. Uh, I guess you all know about that. In 2013, he had a presentation about well, what we are the, uh, the results of the one year of operation. And um, I want to continue this story now. I'm not speaking too much about the phase one system, uh, just uh, to give it ready, I will show some slides, but further to show what's actually going on in the phase two system. That's being installed right now. Um, that's the system, so uh, that was rendered on the system itself, the picture, so it's not a re-picture, but it's being rendered on the system. Um, here's some data. It's roughly a three data for peak system that reach um, when we installed and when we ran the top 500 uh, impact run in June, or May, May timeframe at 24, it reached number 10 in the top 500 class, at number 4. So it works number 10 until last year, if I'm not mistaken. So it's basically based on uh, roughly 10,000 10, warm water cooled uh, concrete nodes, which is the sandy bridge at uh, this uh, point back in 2012. It has um, no, none of the city kind of FDR 10 in the connect. I think that was the only client that has FDR 10, at least in this uh, uh, at this case. It has uh, two two things, uh, two um, different parallel, uh, two different file systems. One is the uh, uh, based on DBFS and uh, DBM storage, and uh, parallel file system with uh, two petabyte storage, uh, with 10 petabyte storage and roughly 200 gigabytes per second uh, I/O bandwidth. The other one is based on a NAS filer, which is um, which is NetApp, so that's a long file system. And that is what I, uh, uh, that's what I mentioned. That's the goal of LRG. So first, we wanted a warm water cooling system like that. I mean, with warm water cooling, you can uh, you can establish your uh, free cooling uh, with outside air works in most of the geographics and at least um, in Germany it works pretty well. Why do you do that? I will show you uh, some details later on. The other one was uh, the, the establishing energy aware scheduling with, uh, with XCAP and load leveler. That means that uh, the load leveler is aware of the applications running in the system at what certain frequency the job has to run to be energy efficient. They are doing profiling of the applications and so we did the measurements before as well on certain applications. You can certainly see that not all applications gain from high frequencies. But what will happen on high frequencies will burn energy like that. Um, so you just gain a little bit of runtime. Um, if you use much lower frequencies, or let's say if you use an optimal frequency, you're not losing runtime that much, but you're gaining a lot of well money in that case. Uh, from the energy. Um, the third one is there's a huge monitoring instance. So the monitoring is based on my finger reaction monitoring on that system, um, 150,000 instances. So it's really heavy. It's from every dim, it's from hard and seed errors from the city bands if there are some. It's really heavy. Um, and after we set up the system, we reached a power usage effectiveness of 1.1. 1.15, so just as a comparison, and a normal air cooled vapor set that is really good, you get up to 1.5. Maybe 1 point, nowadays, 1.4, 1.3. You mean thousands? What? Thousands or thousands? Yeah. How do you calculate it? Well, we're doing end-to-end uh, -end measurements of the uh, power that is consumed by the system itself, plus the same power. So, you can you can do the math by by getting the energy consumption of the complete facility from coolers from uh, from the pumps 
from the um, cranks, everything that is included in them. We did of importance is that this is a commodity system. So there's no accelerators, no GPUs, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, as we have nanonodes here, so of course I want to show a little bit about the IB network. And if you can imagine how 10,000 IB cables look like. We boxed them, and we got them first before the system arrived. So, um, and we have to unpack them and to unroll them and to label them and all that stuff. Um, I, check, I really check each one of the cables, at least each one of the boxes, if they were in the correct length and all that stuff. So that's a couple of um, that's just a summary here of the system before I move over to the uh, phase two system. But just to remember how many components you have in such a system, right? If you just Take that one, that is 8 square meters of CMOS of silicon. That's a lot of money that uh, we are going to pay okay. And which is also impressive is uh, this number below here. We have roughly 12,000 optical and band cables, which is, uh, if, you sum, uh, if you sum up all them, it's about uh, 192 kilometers. So, what else? So, I mean, that's a lot of rough numbers. Uh, this is a, well, that's a known number. So, the complete system, which is hardware and factory maintenance, worth about $83 million of uh, euro. So, that's, that's a known number. And we also know the mass of the system, and I made it better than the person. So, I made it the state indicator. Um, so if you buy a Kobe beef in Germany, it's roughly about 600 euro per kilogram. I think in Switzerland it's much more expensive. But still, it's, it's very expensive. But if you compare it to the price per kilo for a supermarket system, still the steak is very expensive, right? <laughs> so I haven't uh, tasted the supercomputer itself, but I, I think I stick to the steak itself. Try pouring beer over it. <laughs> well, <laughs> only warm beer because it's warm water. Okay, so that's it for the phase one system. That's now the phase two system. And when I was writing the initial slides uh, for, for some other uh, presentations as well, I was thinking, hey, this is Moore's law in protection. So it's really from the size itself, it's one third of the original system. So that's not the phase two system. So this illustration here is really only that big. So it's two rows of, system, of hardware. And uh, if you remember the other picture, from just in the physical dimension, it's one third of the system, roughly same peak So that's more long and more. What we're doing here is, uh, because it turned out to be very elegant, uh, we have such an island approach where we have I would think, well, I use the term island, which is wrong, because island would mean it's um, not linked to the rest of the system, but it's not correct, it's linked to the rest of the system. Let's say it's more a domain. We have domains, which are fully non blocking and three domains, where it's 516 copy nodes, so those are connector uh, pick or uh, director switch. We adopted this uh, design from the phase one to the phase two, because it turned out to be very elegant for the users. So there are not that many jobs that we each be on the 512 compute nodes, or 516 compute nodes. Um, so they allowed the blocking ratio um, <coughs> between those domains. And um, there are just really rare blocks that use more than one of the domains, or more than two or three of them. That's only a few of them. So we established a blocking ratio. I'll have some uh, slides to that uh, afterwards. Um, and that works out for the system. Yeah, what we're adding now, uh, adding now means the system is physically installed. We're actually doing some more tests for it in and uh, some uh, preparation for acceptance. We're adding 3,096 compute nodes, which are based on, that was a former IBM product, uh, initially developed by IBM, now developed by Lenovo. So as it's been taken over from the Lenovo uh, side. Um, it's WCT, 
key is for water cooling technology. So it's the same approach that we're using in water cooling technology in that uh, system. I go into that a little deeper up uh, in a few slides. We're not using an SDR14 interconnect. It um, seems to be very robust. So we're also adding more storage. So we're adding uh, in, in the past or in phase one system, it was classic of GPFS, the PDM storage. It's now GSS, <coughs> so which is GPFS with end-to-end data integrity on the same normal JBoard system. There's no way to control in there. And we're really doing, let's say, software software-wise weight codes. So we are using it plus 3 p with uh, metadata replication, and that's always end-to-end -end data integrity. So we need that we can establish end-to-end, uh, -end really up to the client, not just to the component. Uh, we are adding roughly on this uh, GPFS, GSS technology, uh, 6 petabyte <coughs> network capacity, and uh, the bandwidth should be in the range of 100 gigabytes per second. It's, in fact, it's a little bit more, but that's complex. <coughs> So how is the system built? So it's coming from chip. The chip is a Haskell EP processor, um, roughly 500 gigabytes per second. It's built into a server that has obviously two chips and uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM. Um, that's all built into a chassis. So it's a next scale, it's a Lenovo next scale chassis uh, that just holds 12 servers which is um, also uh, holding on the IT group for the water cooling technology. Um, classical rack infrastructure with the one or the other remembers IDataplex that was a little bit off in the data center and it was turned by 90 degrees. That's no longer the case. So it's a standard rack, uh, standard components. And it's all built up with uh, six of such domains um, with 560 terabytes each um, for a complete system which is roughly three. So that's a computer node, just to give you an overview. Um, I have some details uh, later on. It's actually based on an Haskell E5-2697, which is a 14 core processor and 145-watt uh, TDP processor. It works perfectly on a water cooling technology. Um, and why that is, I have some uh, really good numbers that we measured on the system. Uh, that I want to show you. It's uh, based on the Connect ID in semi fabric. Um, so we took Connect ID because of the uh, uh, because of the increased uh, uh, not increased latency, increased performance on latency, let's say this work, uh, and bandwidth. And also that we were able to uh, connect to our water cooling technology. Um, the chips, um, I don't have to on the slide. The, uh, the normal temperature for the Connect ID card is, it depends on the incoming water, but in between of 40 to 70, 40 to 80 degrees C. So that is absolutely in spec of such an uh, antenna band asset or the chip itself. I think Melanox and the rest of the 103 degrees on, on the chip, chip level. So even with 40 degrees in the temperature on the water side, the chip is not getting hotter than, I think it's 80 degrees. So we're absolutely in fact even with 40 degrees in the So that's what I mentioned in the, uh, in, the in, in the former slides. Let's see Infiniband design of the system. So it's built up on uh, large Orker switches, so large director switches from Elanox with 516 compute nodes each. Why the 516? So it works in the phase one in, with a mandatory requirement to reach 8K cores. 8K is perfect for software engineers for writing applications. And that turned out to be exactly 512 compute nodes. We just added four more to be on the safe side. Uh, just to have spare nodes for, well, you know, it's limited, right? So you want to have enough nodes available for, for the uh, new shit And we just adopted this design to the system. Now it's no longer 8K, it's 12 something K, which is a little odd from the programming model, but it, it, it works. So we have six such domains, plus another one that's holding the IO components. So from a design perspective, we didn't change it for the I.O. components. So we have all the storage, locking servers, um, gateways, whatever connected to a dedicated I.O. Island. And the blocking ratio within such a domain is one to one, so there's no blocking. And between the islands, so if you have computation from here to there, it's one to four. 
And that is because we have 42 of these point switches, and so there is 126 uplinks from each one of the domains. So the blocking ratio is 516 to 126, which is probably. Uh, so the blocking ratio is pretty well for the majority of the, of the applications because we are not placing, that is also part of the, the uh, load leveler with the security and batch system uh, technology, that jobs are not placed across islands. So if it still fits into a domain or into an island, it will be placed in an island. Otherwise, it will wait uh, to be placed in, a, let's say, in an optimal way. So we're not, we not sharing resources if possible, between islands, because that will definitely have an impact because of the running budget. Um, so we're not, so for the phase two now, we are not adding compute, well, we are adding computational resources, <coughs> but we're not adding it to the phase one system. So those are totally unconnected systems. They are not sharing the same thing done. So that's shown here, that's the phase one system with uh, uh, that's 18 compute islands. There's the starting number two because there was a small migration system that's not shown here, and an IO switch. They are not, really not connected to each other. This is the phase two system. The only connection between is the shared files. So that is GPFS. You are using GPFS in, um, in a multi home manner. You have resources that we're adding now are also available to the phase one system and vice versa. That works without connecting the IP packets. And uh, you're just adding uh, uh, IP links uh, from one system to the other system without really adding links between the switches. So that works from the server perspective. So you're not adding the, uh, you're not connecting the IP packets. Reason for that is simple. I mean, if you're, if you're in the installation process of Let's say a new system, we will see hiccups in the IP traffic that will ultimately uh, have an impact on, on the uh, operating system. Uh, we wanted to avoid that, so that's now two dedicated systems. Um, there will often come the question uh, if, if we are allowed to run one huge impact on the complete system. No, <coughs> okay. That's the technology we use. I'm not going deeper into that. Let's just see. Um, what I want to show you is the, uh, the concrete node itself. It's a, don't get irritated by the form factor. It's, uh, in fact, here, that is two concrete nodes. So you see two, two process here in a row, two process here. They are linked to one shared water cooling facility. So you can see from, from here, water is coming in here, and it's flowing across all the components of both systems. And it's uh, has an outlet there. The reason is, uh, can you to me? Um, the reason is simple. It's uh, it's cost. So if you're adding if you're adding uh, water cooling components for each and every single compute node, uh, you're doubling the components. You're doubling the water inlet and outlet uh, flux to the quick connection, of course. So what we did is we just had a uh, we add more to inlet and outlet to two nodes instead of to one node. That is, um, that's, that has one, one downside is that, for example, if this config node has an issue and has to be taken out, it also needs to take out. That shouldn't happen that much in the normal operation. Uh, we have seen that now from the first numbers, from the first data we gathered, that you're not that often in such a situation. Um, the config node, let's say, it's a typical for the available server with several processors, of course. And there's one important remark here. With the water cooling technology, we can, we can drive processes up to 165 volts, TDP. While you will now ask, is there such a processor available? There is one that is exclusively available to Lenovo. Um, I have some data for that. That can only be cooled with water cooling. It cannot be cooled with air. Um, just to give you an example of the uh, cooling works, it has no sound. And so what you see here is, that's a microchannel, that's a prototype of a microchannel uh, uh, cooling. So what we're doing here is, we have, this is connected uh, to a tiny pump, 
And we are drawing in some alcohol just to see how fine granular the cooling itself is. So it's a 50 micron microtrammel cooling capacity. And that's the reason why we can establish such an uh, efficient cooling capacity because the difference between inlet water and the junction temperature of the chip itself is in the range of 15, 15 to 20 K Kelvin. So that's not that much. So with other technologies, you can, well, there, there are others doing water cooling, but the difference is in the efficiency of the coolers and usually the delta T between junction temperature and inlet water temperature is much higher. Here in our case, it's about 50 to 20 Kelvin. Um, some more details about the water cooling technology we use here. Um, so that is, that is real world data that we measure up front while we pick the processor uh, for LLV. What you can see here is um, so the different colors show different compute nodes. We ran an impact on 12 such compute nodes with two processors, exactly the processor that we are using for the client. And we measured uh, the junction temperature of the processor and the limpet performance. So what you can see clearly from here is that the limpet score are really mostly flat for junction temperature in the range of water cooling uh, operates. And that is in that area. So we are in between 18 degrees inlet temperature and up to 45 degrees. So we are operating, we are supporting inlet temperatures of 45 degrees C, which is a lot. We know it works with 50 and 55 and even more. And living rate performance per node remains relatively stable, flat for the normal operation for up to 45 degrees C. If you go then into this, this just remarks, that's the normal junction temperature and often technical system. The reason is simple because you cannot, uh, you cannot operate an airport system that cold to achieve the junction temperature of the processor at, let's say, 60 or 50 degrees C. That's impossible. So the conclusion here is that the water cooling itself enables the highest performance possible for each processor still at any water inlet temperature and at any means to 18 and 45 degrees. Even here, you can see um, um, that, that is uh, uh, that must be in the range of 40 and uh, 50 degrees. Even here, well, you at least operate your system and you still gain significant impact for, uh, results. So, it's just a different view of what we measure. Um, we just picked two compute nodes. So that's one, and that's the other. And we tried uh, varying water inlet temperatures and measured inlet performance. So we started from, which is very cold, 80 degrees C in the temperature. In the temperature, you shouldn't do that. Um, that doesn't work for most of the data centers. But 18 degrees for up to 45, that is normal, that uh, can kind of our data center in Luigi you get a junction temperature that is even for a 45 degrees C inlet temperature, not higher than 60 degrees. Cross, we have to cross. That's not even the area where the airflow system starts. So they are much higher across the <coughs> And that means also that the Linpex score per node is relatively flat. Of course, the Linpex score is or well, the itself is driving a processor, especially the DDX2 unit, to its limit. So they are really reaching the TDP, uh, in that case of 150.5 uh, watts, easily, because they can easily, or they can very good uh, leverage the ADX units. And as you can see, so the, the Linpex performance itself is relatively flat. Uh, what we did here is, let's say, the 55 degrees C, we just decrease the liters per minute per node to achieve a much higher junction temperature. So that is our delta T of 20 uh, Kelvin. Um, so we 
there was, let's say, it was an exercise to increase the junction temperature to up to 75 degrees, even though the impact performance was just a little bit less optimal, I would say. But it's still very okay. You wouldn't be able to do so with more. Yes, yes, and we have, well, it's not properly, yes and no. So it's mostly leakage time. You, you get more leakage time. So if, uh, if, if the temperature increases on the, not only on the CPU, but also on the complete system, you get more leakage time, and so you don't get any high speed That's the reason. So it's the one method that operates, it's either that it goes down. It will, yeah, so if the higher the temperature of the processor, the lower the yeah. yeah. And here's an example where water cooling really makes sense, even with, let's say, moderate high temperatures. This is what I mentioned in the beginning. There's one processor available. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's exclusively available to the Google. It's a 160 watts processor. It's a monster. It's really a monster. It's a 2.8 gigahertz. 16 port processor. That's an unbelievable, uh, powerful uh, processor for Intel. It gets the highest uh, impact performance. Um, that is roughly about one teraflop per per computer per node. And this one cannot be cooled by air. And that's pretty simple to see. That is in the area where normal air cooled systems work. And the junction temperature of this processor is not allowed to go higher than 65 degrees C. So it would start throttling exactly at 65 degrees C at the processor level. The throttling is very bad for applications, so that means it frequently goes down immediately. And it will even stop working at about 68 to 70 degrees C. So it will just turn off because it's, it, it's getting too hot in the processor. So, but with the water cooling technology, you can enable it. So what you can see here, in that area from, let's say, 18 to 35 degrees C, we said 35 degrees C, that's the maximum of inlet temperature that we allow. Uh, that's not possible for all data centers that want to achieve water cooling. But for some days, um, in that range, you can easily operate such a monster. Um, yeah. And on this side, if you were trying to uh, cool that processor with air, it's impossible. It will just not turn on. Um, here at the end, uh, we have some comparison of, um, so those slides will be available, uh, um, how the uh, power and uh, impact performance and performance of works we have measured on the cooling <coughs> system. So, of course, you get uh, a huge number for the performance of what comparison, but yeah, you need to be careful by picking such a processor, because I think that it is very expensive processor. It works, we know that, we measured it for a couple of, uh, for a couple of applications. It works pretty well for, for some applications, but the majority of applications would probably not gain from 16 cores uh, in the single socket and at the end at least uh, 2.8 gigahertz. So, and you have to pay the reasonable cost. But if you can gain from it, so if you have an application gaining from high frequencies and from the most possible uh, cores and socket, you can buy this processor and you can only cool it with water. But it works for you. Yeah, I think that's the it mostly. No, it's not. So, um, what we also measured is the um, lower power consumption. So, with water cooling. <laughs> uh, what you can see if you, if you drive in a water cooled system as we do it with the phase one with the phase two system is that the power consumption per node is roughly 10% uh, below a comparable air cooled system. Why that? It's aimed to save about 5% because of missing, lower, uh, missing fans. You don't have any fans for a water cooled system. And other 5% are for less leakage because your, your power consumption is a little bit less. And that's exactly, exactly what we're showing here. So the 
water temperature is, uh, for example, here it's at 18 degrees C, and this one is at, uh, where is it, 45 degrees C. What we measured is the socket power consumption, or the power consumption per socket, and that's compared to an airport system, which is uh, those here. Um, oh, I was just thinking. So this is the um, CPU of the water cool system, and those are for the aqua system. So the comparison is really, if you see this delta between here, the aqua system is utilizing at the same level a little bit more power. That's exactly the 5%. So while you're doing water cooling, you can gain up to 5%. It really depends on the, on the boundaries, maybe more. So if you're cooling with cold water, with a really cold water, let's say 18 degrees C, you can gain more than 5% per node that, you're, uh, that you have to spend for a comparable electrical system. Because it's not that efficient. And that is mostly of um, uh, leakage currents that increase the hot of the system. So if you can, moder uh, if you can operate a system at the lower temperatures, you, you gain really just 5%, uh, really 5% uh, just from the water cooling, just from the lower power draw to system because of the overall temperature. Um, there are some advantages here. But so for example, that's what I meant. Um, because you know, our power consumption is reduced by 10%, that's our missing flowers, and 5% and we get from the uh, increase or from the lower power consumption of concrete oil. We can also enable this, um, the um, our energy savings on the data center level. So you don't need well, if you're building or if you have the chance to turn off existing uh, air cool, uh, suppress, so, so for example, um, or yeah, air cooling facilities, you can gain up to 40% just on not using them because you don't need them. It's not heating up the data center because what we're doing is we're putting roughly 80 to 90% of the energy into water, not into air as an ecosystem. So if you can water, uh, if you can operate that, you can just roughly 40% save on energy and on the data center. That will enable, and that's what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, power usage effectiveness factor of 1.1. 1.1 to 1.2, where normal data center is in the range of 1.5. Um, yeah, that's being it from my side. Um, yeah, I just put here some pictures on the uh, current ongoing installation. Uh, we left the doors so that we, well, it, it, it's my talking some pictures so we see the, the uh, clean cabling of the system. It has really one IP cable, one internet cable, that's it. And on the other side, you see the uh, water cooling infrastructure, so it's stainless steel. It's, um, the reason for stainless steel is simple because of the micro channel tool that we use. We, we can't use black steel in a normal data center environment because you get corrosion, you get particles in the water in the first, yeah. and we need stainless steel. So and with stainless steel, we can achieve uh, this efficient water cooling with really just 20, 15 to 20 degrees um, of Kelvin delta T between junction temperature and in, in the water. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's not sharp, the picture, but there's a current installation. Uh, it's running right now. It's doing the first uh, acceptance test. It's doing the first wind test, of course. And it's really, let's say, following our measurement that we did up front on the sample nodes, where we clearly can see that with the uh, inlet temperature between 18 and 45 degrees C, uh, we have very stable, very flat wind test scores. Um, that's also for all the other applications so that you really can operate your data center according to outlet uh, to the outside air. And that's really what LRV is doing. They are using uh, free air cooling. What they simply do is they pump the hot water to the roof of the data center and they let it cool by the outside air. So the temperature of the system itself varies according to the uh, summer or winter times. In winter, the normal operators normally operate the water temperature is much lower because it's just cold outside. And in summer, well, yes, we get up to 45 degrees inlet temperature because it's simply hotter outside. But even with 45 degrees inlet, it will be 50 to 55 outlet temperature, uh, degree C, of course, 
and it's still okay to even in very hot summers to get free air cooling. So in Munich era, you don't get 50 degrees of high temperature. So even if it's very hot, you get 40, 45 degrees, and still that is still that makes it possible to cool the system in the water with free air, which is free, of course, right? So that's the reason they can operate the system at the PE uh, level of one or more. And I think that's been it from my side. Yes, so um, uh, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for organizing this event. And uh, I had some fun yesterday. So I will see you. So if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. There is one. So the question is, what type of system we use to monitor? So we are using a singer. So I think it's close of uh, nine years, which is, which is pretty cool. So what we did for the monitoring is not just monitoring. We also do a sort of call home. So in case of an event, we just call home back to IBM or to Lenovo to please change this uh, memory did or change the disk or so. So that's all implemented in these uh, singer instances. Uh, that's a uh, slash 11 in sort of factory. That must be an enterprise distribution. In principle, we could use any other operating or any other Linux style operating system. But it fits together with IP, with PFS, uh, and all that stuff. So that was the reason to be in the enterprise. Is it standard or is some customization done by the Well, we, no, so it's done. So we are using a completely distal system, but that is based on a standard. Less than that, we do. We're just putting the notice and that's it. We're using XCAT as a cluster management system, but that is based on the standard. standard. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.